I knew long ago that I was looking for something. And I didn't know what it was, but my approach was to travel hard and widely and pay attention. To simply go and to see the world, not on my terms, but on its terms, as, as much as I could manage that. If you stay in this place out of fear, you will not find the landscape that your imagination is yearning for. The effort of the imagination is to turn the boundary into a horizon, because there's no end point for you. The boundary says, here and no further. The horizon says, welcome. and 40s and 50s and 60s, I loved having my face in the wind. I loved the push through pain and inconvenience to get to the thing that was the object of the quest. Where I want to go are to the places that my culture considers undistinguished. So I always end up in deserts or in Antarctica or in the open ocean. And that big open stage engages me. I don't want to be inside a building looking inside things that are in display cases. I want to be outside watching things that will never be in a display case. Look at this light. It's everywhere, and that's something that is very special to the desert, it's unique. The first time I came out on these, on these playa deserts, I got into my van and I drove out across the space and that's where I first began to understand how intimidated I was, how tyrannized I was by this vehicle that I drove all over North America in. When I thought, well, I, you know, I'm not on a road anymore, I don't have to drive, I can just, you know, I can turn around like this. You know, I got up and I got in the back seat. You can open the door and uh, and get out. It is a fabulous idea, though. Look at it. But look at that. Who is the guy who's driving this thing? There's nobody there, you know? Space is like air or like darkness or like silence. All of those things are natural resources. Quiet silence. This is a repository of silence. I think one of the reasons our lives are difficult is because of this separation we've insisted on from the rest of the natural world. And that they insist, our insistence on the primacy of human life. Human history is but one dimension of natural history. And it's not the other way around. talking about beauty as though beauty were only skin deep. But real beauty is so deep, you have to move into darkness in order to understand what beauty is. What and that's mean? what you, well, it's just what you said. You're talking to your wife and this blue sky goes gray and a horror, a horror visits us. If, if, you, if you try to separate these two things, you're in trouble. What you must do is build a system of civilization that is as aware of darkness as it is of beauty. What is our moral relationship, or to 
put it another way, what is our ethical relationship to the world outside ourselves. The sign of where it goes wrong is when the world outside the self is no longer the companion but the servant. time and we're reminded of it every day mostly with events that are loosely connected with global climate change and I can feel when I travel the anguish that people carry where in another time they might have been carrying hope and I want as a writer to do something to ameliorate that anxiety because the more anxious we are, the more paralyzed we become, and in that paralysis is our ending. There's something in me that needs to go into the darkness, into the danger, in order to understand what it is that, that all of us have to face. absolutely nothing. I, I happened to grab my purse on the way, but Barry didn't have his cancer drugs. He didn't have his money, his wallet. We had nothing else but our just the clothes on our packs. And we drove away here thinking we'd never see this place again. We've definitely seen a vast reduction in rainfall. When I first got to know Barry and we were I was spending time here, he told me that this area gets about 103 inches a year. That was the average at that point, and I think most years now, it's half of that, um, if even half. Long before the fire, we were noticing that Douglas fir trees were suffering and dying. Uh, they just have such a shallow root system, and they depend on that kind of constant Oregon drizzle, which disappeared. So it's definitely changing, and when people tell me how it's gonna all come back and be beautiful after this fire, I, I know it will be beautiful in its own way, but it's never gonna be what it was because there's the climate isn't here anymore to support the kind of life that Barry stewarded for all these years. I mean, for 50 years, he watched over this land and he didn't really want humans to go up into the land because he wanted to know that there was a place on the river where animals could go and make their homes and be at peace and not have to worry about humans tromping by. He just really wanted it to be left absolutely alone. But now that's the part that was burned the worst. When the fire happened, it, I, I just could not, could not bear thinking that he was losing the forests around him and then losing his writings. And, and I didn't know how to talk to him about that, these amazing losses. I miss having those ears to listen to my great, great pain and listening to his great pain. I think the fire was just, just more than he could manage. It, it really did him in. It, it's possible to choose to die in a good way. You know, you, you can't make special arrangements because your death is imminent. You have to continue to lead the life you are leading. So then the question becomes something like, um, 
What is a beautiful death? You know, he had talked about crossing the river as just, it was time for him to cross the river. And we just said what we needed to say and I was sitting right next to him and holding his hand and he just took his last breath. It was a beautiful death, but the second he was gone, I just wanted him to come back. Barry, dear Barry, it's it's Robert McFarlane here. I I wanted to speak to you, um, not write to you, speak to you because uh, my heart is full and and my voice will carry it a little better than than type can. I wanted to send this message of of love um, and of, of 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 deepest heartfelt gratitude and admiration to you. My dear friend, I wish our paths had crossed more than once in person, that we'd walked forests together, that we'd swum rivers together and climbed mountains together and drunk loads of whiskey together. All those years ago, in 1997, when I carried Arctic dreams up through bear country, west coast of Vancouver Island, and just my mind blown by what I read on the page, by what you showed could be possible in terms of fusing a moral, ethical vision uh, with an astonishing force of experiment and voice and empathy and complexity of tone. And what you made language do, what you made history do, what you made vision do. And it, it changed my life. You're the writer that made me a writer, you're the writer that shaped everything, I think. I, I, I would always come back to that encounter as the, the fork in my life. You are my touchstone and you are my lodestar. And I often look, look to the horizon and I look, I look for you. I really am just a conduit in, in the sense that I don't have an agenda. I love language, I love story, and I really love how story reconstitutes, reorients, elevates human beings. I've been trying hard not to dwell on, on what his loss really means to the world. We need his writing. We need his caring. We need to be thoughtful about the, the planet. We need to cherish our, our pure waters, our forests, and, and uh, we need to find good writers to replace it. Take, a, take about six for good writers to take his place. And so. Really, truly, I feel like I would often forget that Barry was this you know, revered writer. I, he was just my husband, and you know, we just had a very simple domestic life. The greatest joy I had was watching him play with the little grandchildren. He just came alive around them, and just the way they would play and tease, and he could just kind of be a little kid with them, and the way he would show them the salmon or. You know, he was his, I think he was his absolute true self. You know, that's probably how I'm going to remember him the most. The stories I'm talking about that I'm trying to write are stories that contribute to stability, to the stability of my own culture. I want 
to be out there. I, years ago, I would sit at my desk working and I would look out at the river and I would think, boy, you know, the only thing that's difficult in living here is that I can't very often stand in the blazing light. And it dawned on me that if I was out there, I wouldn't have that problem. And on a summer day, I can wade out to those rocks out there with my stuff in a Ziploc and do my work out there on those basalt boulders that are in the river. So it was a reimagining of the space that's out there defined by that river. It taught me that given this situation we're in, uh, traditional people would say, this is something that has to be dreamed again. You've got to move through the organization of the physical world uh, another time in order to get the orientation you need to not be done in by the things, the forces that are around you. It was available to stand there in direct sunlight on a summer day working out there. Kayakers would, would say, hey, you okay? Did you fall out of a boat? <laughs> no, I'm all right. I'm, I'm good. We need another way of knowing. And if we are to succeed at that, we must listen not only to each other, but to those we have systematically marginalized. It's not about you. You don't own the story. Carry it beautifully and give it to somebody else. <laughs>